All right, we are starting tonight our first installment of our study of the Apostolic Fathers or the Apostolic Writings. So, what are the Apostolic Writings? A little introduction. We know that the New Testament is Apostolic Writings. The New Testament is written by apostles. And um, so what do we mean when we talk about the apostolic fathers or the apostolic writings? Well, we're talking about those writings that are written at the same time or near to the time of the apostles. All right, so these are the apostolic fathers. These are the fathers of the church who knew the apostles, or knew those who knew the apostles. Okay? Normally you divide the patristic literature into a few different sections. The earliest literature is what's called the apostolic writings, or the apostolic fathers. This is the earliest of what we would call the patristic literature, that is Christian writings outside of the New Testament. Some of it overlaps with the time of writing of what you and I call the New Testament. And so therefore, some of it actually predates some of the stuff that's in our New Testament, as with the Didache, as we'll see. So the New Testament is the collection of writings which was read over and over and over again in the early Christian churches. This is the, uh, what we call the canonical writings, the things that are read by rule, canon. These are the things that, as a rule, as was custom, practice, almost universally, these books were read. And as we talked before in our study of the topic of Sola Scriptura and tradition, it is from the early Christian liturgy, the celebration of the liturgy, that we develop this early Christian lectionary, a system and, and pattern of reading of the early Christian writings. And from that lectionary comes eventually what we call a Bible, a collection of books that is originally used in the liturgical setting, although today, you know, you might have it bound and you could go buy it down at Walmart or something like that. But in the early church, the first book that we find among the early Christians is, along with scrolls of what you and I would call the Old Testament, is, uh, is the beginning of collections of this early Christian literature, which eventually becomes what you and I call the New Testament. Where does the New Testament come from? Well, after centuries and centuries of liturgical celebration and lectionary development, the dust starts to settle and it becomes quite obvious which writings are read consistently in all of the churches. Although you go to one church and you might find that they're not reading one of the books. Or you go to another church and you find they're reading some books that are not in the book collections of the other churches, okay? So it's not simply, you know, a hard and fast rule that everyone suddenly, you know, ended up with what you and I call the New Testament somewhere in the third century, and then that was it. No, it goes on and on. Uh, in the third, fourth century, we, we see manuscripts of what you and I call the New Testament that has in it things like the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistle of Barnabas, the uh, Letter of Clement to the Corinthians, these were bound in with what you and I would call the New Testament. So it shows that at this time things are still somewhat fluid, right? So where do we get the apostolic writings? What are these apostolic writings? These apostolic writings are not some new stage in the early church. We have the New Testament and we close that door and now we move into the apostolic writings. But rather the apostolic writings and what we call the New Testament are a fluid, have a fluid relationship. And what we today put in our New Testament and, and then in a separate book called the Apostolic Writings 
as a result of 2,000 years of lectionary cycles are then what we call the New Testament and the apostolic writings. You see how that works? But when you go back to the early church, the first few centuries, these things are relatively still uh, fluid in when you go from one place to another. And I'm not talking about just some places are reading certain books that we don't read anymore. There are certain places that, are reading, that weren't reading books that you and I would consider part of the New Testament. For example, during the time of St. John Chrysostom, doctor of the church, in Byzantium, in Constantinople, they were not reading from what you and I would call the book of Revelation. And we know that because we read the homilies of St. John Chrysostom, and nowhere in any of his homilies is there ever a reference to what you and I would call the book of Revelation, which means in ancient Byzantium at that time in Constantinople, the book of Revelation wasn't read. It wasn't part of the lectionary cycle. Again, this is, this is before publication of official books and things like that, okay? These are collections of scrolls in this place and that place, and, you know, one bishop visits another church, and what are you guys reading here? Oh, that sounds interesting. Let's get a copy, and I'll take it home with me, and we'll read it there, you know? This is why Protestantism just doesn't work. Protestantism assumes the authority of what uh, what, we know, what we call the New Testament, the Bible, New Testament Bible, but doesn't assume the authority that gives it to us. You can't have a Bible without an early church. And the Bible has no authority outside of the witness of the early church. And therefore, the early church liturgical practice that gives us this Bible is also the early church liturgical practice that gives us today the Christian Sunday celebration called the Divine Liturgy in the East, the, uh, in the, uh, the West, the Mass, called the Holy Korbana in the Syriac tradition, which, if you look at them in roots, they're all the same. They all go back to this early liturgical celebration that celebrated the gift of our Lord in his body and blood in the Eucharist. And in preparation for that, they would read from what you and I would call the apostolic writings, which again, that early stage was not only what you and I call the New Testament, but also some of these books that we're going to look at in this study, and in some cases, uh, in some churches, you know, the, the absence of some of these books. Again, we can't have a Bible and assume its authority and its canon and its structure and at the same time ignore the very early church that gave that to us. It's simply not logical. Simply illogical. Okay, so... What are we doing then in the study? We're going to be looking at the apostolic fathers. The apostolic fathers, okay? So what you want to do, if you don't have a copy of the apostolic fathers, you want to get one, all right? So the apostolic fathers, you can get a collection off Amazon.com. There's a few different editions of it. One of the best and cheapest and easiest to get a hold of is the one put out by Penguin Classics. Penguin Classics early Christian writings, early Christian writings. These are also all available on the internet. You can go to Wikipedia and get copies of these things, okay? So you don't have to go out and buy it, although it is quite handy to have it in one volume, okay? Now, why is it important to look at these apostolic writings? We've got the Bible, don't we? Why do we need this thing? Well, you don't need this thing. You don't even need your Bible, by the way. What you need is the church tradition. You need the tradition of the apostles. That's what you need. But along the way, the church has found useful the reading of apostolic writings, and those apostolic writings being eventually what you and I would call the New Testament. But you also find in early church Bibles some of these very books we're going to be looking at. Okay? Now, these are extremely important for you to read, as we're going to see today. Because in a book like, say, the Didache, which we're going to look at first tonight, the earliest of the apostolic writings, you find the description of a church that sounds very similar to church that you attend on Sunday. 
If you're a Melkite, a Byzantine Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Coptic Orthodox, Ethiopian, Russian Orthodox or Russian Catholic, if you're from one of the apostolic traditions, then when you read the Didache, you say, oh yeah, <laughs> nothing new there. But I'll tell you what, if you're a Baptist and you read this, you don't know what to do with it. And so as I mentioned to you in our study of the topic of Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, or tradition, while that topic is very important in apologetics, the subject of the apostolic fathers is second to it. Okay, When you read conversion stories of someone like Scott Hahn, Jeff Cavins, Marcus Grodi, uh, uh, Peter Gilquist, when you read the conversion stories of these individuals, famous, I say relatively famous, I mean, in our day and age, relatively kind of well-known converts from Protestantism, these guys are Protestant scholars, Protestant ministers. These individuals are converting in droves because what happens is when they get into their ministry, they start doing their Bible studies and they start prepping for their homilies. And as they start reading their Bible really carefully and really thoroughly and teaching Bible studies, they find that what they're doing and saying on Sunday doesn't seem to line up with actually what's here. In fact, one of the critical moments for many of these conversion stories I mentioned is the realization that nowhere in the Bible and the Bible alone does the Bible teach the Bible and the Bible alone. So if that's the case, what do we do? And when they realize that, the first thing they do is head for the early church writings. They say, if the Bible and the Bible alone is not taught anywhere in the Bible and the Bible alone, then my best guide for reading the Scripture, my best guide for understanding the faith, my best guide for understanding who Jesus is, is the early church that gave me the Bible. And so I don't need to only read the New Testament. I need to read the writings of the very people that handed the New Testament to me. That's Ignatius of Antioch. Irenaeus. Justin Martyr. Clement of Alexandria. When you read them, you find, however, nothing like what you find in a Baptist church. Right? In fact, what you'll typically hear is two stages in a conversion. I realize that nowhere in the Bible, in the Bible alone, does the Bible teach the Bible, in the Bible alone. Then I started reading the early church writings. I read the Apostolic Fathers. And I realized that my church on Sunday and what we teach and what we do looks nothing like the church in the first century or the second century. And so then what happens is they start to rethink everything they're doing. They have a little you know, identity crisis and they start delving into reading the fathers. And before you know it, they find themselves in the pew of a Greek Orthodox church or Roman Catholic church or Melkite church or Russian Orthodox church or something like that, right? Okay, so very important for you to be familiar with these books because here you find the evidence from the early Christian church that what you are doing today has been faithfully handed on to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul said would happen when he spoke to, to Timothy in his first epistle. Okay? So, where do you get a copy of these things I mentioned? You can go online, you can go on Wikipedia, Google Didache, or the, the Letters of St. Ignatius, things like that, and you'll find these come up online. Most of the translations are good enough, uh, but it is helpful because stuff on the internet is sometimes a little uh, not so uh, scholarly. It is helpful to find something that's actually been published by a publisher because then you have a little more chance of it being well done. And so I recommend to you the Early Christian Writings by Penguin Classics because it's a very inexpensive and well-known 
uh, translation that is considered across the board to be authoritative, okay, and scholarly. All right, so now, what are we going to look at first? We're going to look at now the didache, the didache, okay? The didache, if you turn in your, into your Penguin Classics or whatever, you, uh, whatever translation you have, you find in your table of contents the didache, the didache. Didache is a Greek word. Didache means the teaching, teaching. The full title of this work is the teaching of the 12 apostles, the teaching of the 12 apostles, okay? All right, so now you can turn there in my particular translation of the Didache. It is on page, what is this, 191, 191 in Penguin Classics, page 191 in the Penguin Classics edition I have. I did also send out, by the way, in the email today, reminding you of the Bible study or our book study tonight, uh, I did send you also in that email a text of the Didache that you can print off and use as well, okay? Either way, I recommend you have a hard copy in front of you so that you can mark it up and highlight it just like your Bible. And then you can loan it out to somebody, right? You might say, well, I'm just going to listen. Okay, well, when, if, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come, are you going to then speak it? Right? You, it's very helpful to have it documented, written down with notes, just like in your Bible. Okay? All right, so we're going to look at page 191 now, the didache. The didache. So uh, when is, where, what is this book? I said it's the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. That's the original title. It is, has been dated by scholars to have been written somewhere around the second half of the first century. The second half of the first century. Okay, so that's going to put it in the same exact period as the writings of the New Testament. The earliest writings of the New Testament are 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians, 1st Corinthians, 2nd Corinthians, stuff like that, Matthew's Gospel. That's the earliest stuff. And then after that, things start to overlap chronologically in time. All right? All of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, are written easily before 70, before the destruction of Jerusalem. It's pretty obvious. And uh, Paul's epistles are all written before 70 because, of course, Paul died before then. Right? So uh, Peter's epistles are written before 70 because uh, he died before then. He died in the mid to late 60s. All right, so then uh, the Didache, this is a fairly, very early work, and if you read it carefully and you know the New Testament real well, you'll hear echoes of the New Testament all over it. But what's really fascinating is the echoes, for the most part, are from the earliest New Testament writings, which again would tend to place it right around the 60s, somewhere in the 60s, late 50s or 60s in its composition. If you look at the quotations, you could date it slightly later than that, 70s or 80s or something like that. Some have suggested the date is as late as 120. It really doesn't matter. You're dealing with a text that comes from the period of the apostles. You say, well, what's the difference of this in the New Testament? Well, the Didache is an interesting text because it's basically a catechism. It's an early church catechism. Nowhere in the New Testament do you have a catechism. You have, a go you have gospels, a certain type of literature, and you have epistles, in which you surely get catechesis, some teaching, but this is the earliest church catechism, a systematic kind of organized layout of the basics of the faith and what we do as Christians. Okay? Most of you are familiar with an idea of a catechism. Right? All right. In fact, didache, teaching, cate catechism, teaching. Right? It's the same thing. All right. So then, there are two parts to this. There are two parts, two major parts to the didache. The first six chapters is a uh, a, um, a exhortation to live the righteous life. It divides the first, well, the majority of this first six chapters is all about what you want to do as a Christian and what you don't want to do as a Christian. And then it concludes with 
the way of darkness. So there's the way of light, which it goes in all sorts of details about the way of light versus the way of darkness. If you've ever read the book of wisdom, if you've ever read the book of wisdom from the Old Testament, you can see this. The book of wisdom has heavy influence on early Christian literature. Most people don't know that because they think, well, my Bible doesn't have any in New Testament index references to it. Well, that's because the index was made by a Protestant, not the Book of Wisdom. But if you know the Book of Wisdom real well and you go into the New Testament, especially Matthew's Gospel, you hear echoes of it all over the place. I know a, um, a Methodist, or a Protestant, biblical scholar who uh, um, was working on this very subject, the use of the Book of Wisdom and Sirach and other wisdom literature in the Gospel of Matthew. All right, so then... Uh, Let's take a look at that first half now, that for, or the first part of this, first section of this, of this book. So, look at how it begins. This is page 191. There are two ways, a way of life and a way of death. And the difference between the two ways is great. All right, so you get this idea in the New Testament in a number of places. The narrow gate versus the wide gate in Matthew's Gospel. All right. Uh, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, and you'll see some other Deuteronomic references here, the book of Deuteronomy ends with Moses saying, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Like the famous bumper sticker today, right? Choose life. That comes from Deuteronomy. And so look, let's look at a few lines here just to get a taste of it, and then we'll move on. There are two ways. The way of life and the way of death. And the difference between the two ways is great. The way of life is this. Thou shalt love first the Lord thy Creator, and secondly thy neighbor as thyself. And thou shalt do nothing to any man that thou wouldst not wish to be done to thyself. Where do you hear this? You hear this in a number of places in the New Testament. Jesus teaches this way. And you can see this, for example, in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. What you may learn from these words is to bless them that curse you and to pray for your enemies. Hmm, I've heard that before. Yeah, this comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And to fast for your persecutors, so to pray for them. For where is the merit and loving only those who return your love? Right? Do not, do not even the heathen do that? Do not even the tax collectors and the pagans do that? Remember Jesus says this? This is Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 now. Beware of the carnal appetites of the body. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to the other one to him as well. Perfection will be yours. Should anyone compel you to go a mile, go with him another. So, or go with him. So this is exactly what you hear in Matthew's Gospel, right? What's really interesting here is the quotations out of the Gospels, for the most part, are going to be from Matthew's Gospel, which has led many to conclude that this book, the Didache, is in close geographic association with Matthew's Gospel. Now, Matthew's Gospel, according to the early church, is written for a Palestinian Syrian audience, that region there of early church, uh, the, early, the early Christians. And, and you look at the Didache, you see tons of quotes right out of Matthew's Gospel, particularly, which again points probably to not only geographical, but also chronological origin. It tells you how early it is. Okay, so then, um, and we don't have to look at all the examples of this. You can see tons of examples like this from uh, Matthew's Gospel that you've heard before. Uh, it goes on, if anyone takes your coat, let them have your shirt too. If anyone seizes you, belong, seizes something, do not ask for it back. Give to everyone who asks without looking for repayment. It is the Father's pleasure that we should share His gracious bounty with all men. You should hear an echo of your Father is gracious and causes the rain to fall on the good and the bad. This is right out of Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to the end of the chapter. Look what it says even. It says, uh, if you continue on uh, later on in the section, it says, and He will not... Uh, uh, let's see here. A giver who gives freely as the commandment directs is blessed. No fault can be found with him. But woe to the taker, for though, thou, though he cannot be blamed for taking it, if he was indeed yet, uh, in need, yet if he was not, an account will be required of him as to why he took it and for what purpose, and he will be taken into custody exam before his actions, and he will knock it out until he has paid the last penny. That's Matthew chapter 5, verse 26. Right? Notice how the author here is freely quoting from what you and I call Matthew's gospel. 
right? This is how they had the text in their head. They would just speak about Matthew's gospel or the gospel that was being read in their local church, and, and they, had, they could speak about it as the way that a modern person today could quote from, oh, I don't know, modern literature, right? Okay, so then that's chapter one or section one, all right? Then chapter two goes on to talk about the second commandment in the teaching means commit no murder, adultery, sodomy, fornication, or theft. And it goes on to things. So here's what you should do. Here's what you shouldn't do, right? Kind of thing. This is very similar to Matthew's gospel as you continue reading here. And then it concludes with, look at this last line of this section. This is chapter 4 now. The last line of chapter 4. In church, make confession of your faults and do not come to your prayers with a bad conscience. You heard that before. Jesus says that if you have a fault with your brother, leave your gift at the altar and then go, right? And look at the word church. In church, make confession of your faults. The use of the word church like that, that's Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 18. This is not a word that appears all over the New Testament. It appears in only certain literature in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 18. And then after talking about the way of life, here's what you should do as a Christian. Now it says, by comparison, here's the way of death. Right? And it goes on to say, the way of death is this. Murderers, adulterers, right? It goes on, fornicators, etc. Okay? All right. Now, then you get a little conclusion, chapter 6, a little conclusion, saying, therefore, choose life, basically. And then we come to the next part, which is, I think, of particular interest to us in our study. It's called, uh, basically, for lack of a better title, the church manual, okay? Here, how do you celebrate the liturgy when we gather together? Now, you and I might say, well, the liturgy, that's just part of being Christian, right? No. For the early Christians, gathering together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, this was the ultimate Christian life. This was Christian existence. Everything, every, when you walked out of the liturgical celebration, your whole life out there in that world was a memory of what had just happened and was intended to inform what you were doing with your actions out in the world. And then you went, and then you also began to yearn for the next Christian gathering. This is what Christians did. They gathered together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so it shouldn't be a surprise then, if you know that, that the second half of this section is all about what do you do when you gather together as a Christian. Right? That's their catechesis. There's an ancient patristic saying in Latin, lex orandi, lex credendi. Right? The rule or the way of faith is the rule or the way of prayer. And when we say prayer there, we don't mean in your you know, home in your closet, we mean prayer, the gathering, the liturgical prayer. What we pray together is what we believe. What we believe is what we pray together. The liturgy was the ancient form of catechesis. Okay, so then, first of all, then you're going to have to talk about baptism. Right? How do you baptize? So this is page 194, 194 of the Penguin Classics edition. Baptism. First of all, when you gather together as Christians, let's talk about baptism, right? That's the first most important thing. Now, for Christians today, baptism is something that you do once in a while. But for them, it was something that was done all the time, on a regular basis, because there were conversions in droves. Every time you gathered together, it was time to baptize somebody. How can we do that today? Because we're not living a Christian life. We're not living an evangelical life. Right? We're busy watching Oprah and, and uh, you know, and the Today Show and whatever, Good Morning America and CNN. But in, the, in their life, their very life, everything they did was Christian. Where they did, what they did, what they said, how they acted. And so they, their life, their words were evangelical. And so when a Christian went out into the world, into the workplace, in the neighborhood, he was, what you hear today, a contagious Christian. It was like a guy going out with the flu bug into a crowd, coughing all over him. He'd come back the next Sunday with a drove of people following him. Would that we were like that today? Today we're afraid 
to speak out about our faith. And we had the freedom to do it. Wait till we don't have the freedom to do it. And then yearn that we did. Those days might be coming even here. Okay, so look how it says to baptize. It says the procedure for baptizing is as follows. This is section 7 or chapter 7. After repeating all that has been said, immerse in running water. So you've catechized them, you've prepared them, and now you immerse them. Baptize. Baptizo in Greek means to dunk under the water, submerse. Early church baptism was always done what we would call full immersion. Today, full immersion is something you say, oh, that's what the Baptists do, or oh, that's what they're, that's kind of a new idea, isn't it? No, it's the old idea because baptism was understood to be a renewal of creation. You're being drawn out of the muddy water. You're being drawn from the waters of the flood. You're being drawn from the crossing of the Red Sea. You're being drawn from the Jordan River. You're being drawn out of that river like name in the Syrian. Leprosy washed away, right? A new man. You, were, you came out of those waters, a new creation, like Noah in the ark and like Israel crossing to the other side. Right? That was how they understood. So it's full immersion. A drowning image was often there. You see in the prayers, in fact. Look at uh, Romans 6. Paul says, all of you who have been baptized to Christ have died with him and have been buried with him and then risen with him to newness of life. That's immersion imagery there. Okay, so it says immerse them in running water. Why running water? Again, here you get a semitism, an early Christian image. This is math, methane kind of period and region. Running water in Hebrew, when you see in the Old Testament living water or running water in your translation, in the Hebrew it's living water because for the Hebrews, movement meant life. If something moved, it was alive. If it didn't move, it wasn't alive. That's why you could eat of the fruit of a tree in the garden and nothing was dying because trees don't move, right? But uh, if you had an animal, then you're eating life because it moves. This is the difference, even the Aristotelian differences of, you know, of uh, the plant soul, the animal soul, right? Okay, so then running water, moving water, living water, living water. Why? Because the living water, the running water, was the image of the water of the, of the river of life. The river, living water that ran from Mount Sinai to lead the people of Israel to Mount Sinai so they'd receive the Torah. Jesus says over and over, I am the source of the living water. So it's the image of the water gives life. And of course, think of all the images from the Old Testament, the Garden of Eden, the, um, and then the, uh, the river of life flowing from Mount Sinai, etc., all right, so running water. So what did they use? Ideally, when they were in Palestine, they used the Jordan River. We still get that in our prayers. The baptismal water is blessed, and the priest asks that this baptismal water become the water of the Jordan. For real. Right? So we pray and we ask that this water be the water of the Jordan, the water in which Jesus was baptized, the water sanctified by Jesus himself. And so, and that's where the early Christians, they could, they would baptize in the Jordan. If they couldn't baptize in the Jordan, they'd find some, another moving water, a river, a spring. In fact, early churches historically were built right on top of springs because they used the spring water so, the, so that the baptismal pool was constantly gurgling and bubbling and flowing, this image of life. Now, it says, and you do it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Right? This is just what Jesus says in Matthew's gospel. Again, quotes out of Matthew all over this thing. Now it says, if you have no running water, then just immerse them in non running water. <laughs> right? That means a pool. Still immersing, by the way. It says, this should be cold if possible. Cold. Why? It's invigorating, right? You dump someone in warm water, ah, right? You throw them in ice cold water, woo, right? They're filled with their oh. So they would use ice cold water, which the spring water typically was, because it also gave you a sense of freshness and life. And it says if you don't have cold water, then use warm water, fine. If neither is, uh, is able, then pour water on their head three times in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And he said, 
But that's how they baptize today. Yeah, right? Look how far we are. Today, the normal baptism for people in their mind is pouring water over their head three times. But in the early church, that was what you did. If you couldn't do it right, well, that's how you do it, okay? It's still valid, fine. But it was your last resort. It's basically a missionary baptism. If you're not in a church, you're out there in the, in the, uh, in the field, pour the canteen over the guy's head before he dies, okay? So, but that's what's become the norm today. How minimalistic, how minimalistic. What a tragedy. And so often our baptismal ceremonies are not evangelical. They don't present the faith in living color like they did in the early church, right? In the Eastern churches, and I'm speaking also to those who are Roman Catholic logged in and things, but the, in the Eastern churches, of course, we still baptize both by full immersion and thank God in the Western tradition, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, they're starting to return to this baptism, full immersion. And the Roman Catechism states this explicitly that that is the ideal, full immersion. All right, now that's how you baptize. Then it says, on feast days and prayers, do not uh, keep the same fast, I'm sorry, on fast days in prayer, do not keep the same fast days as the hypocrites. Now, where do you hear that kind of language? Don't do as the hypocrites do. Where is that in the New Testament? Matthew's Gospel, right? Matthew chapter 6. Don't do what the hypocrites do. Do it this way. Don't, when, the, when the hypocrites fast, this is how they do it. Don't act like the hypocrites. When you get to the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus calls the Pharisees and scribes the hypocrites, Right? So who's running Judaism in this period? Mainly the Pharisees, right? And so you're getting a parting of ways of the early Christians from the Pharisees here. Are you going to be a Pharisee? Are you going to be a Jew and act like a Pharisee? Or are you going to follow the apostles and their teachings and the ways of Jesus, right? And so don't fast like the hypocrites. They fast on Mondays and Thursdays. So the Jews in the first century fasted on Mondays and Thursdays because they believed this, these were the days Moses went up Mount Sinai and the day he came down. Right? He was up there for three days, right? Went up on, on Monday, came down on Thursday, brought down the law, and the people of Israel received the word of God. Right? They were saved. They joined in covenant. The Christians, however, fast, he says, on Wednesdays and Fridays. Why? Why do we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays? Because, as we know from the early church liturgical cycles, this was the understanding of the beginning and the end of Jesus' passion. Most people think of Jesus' passion as, you know, Thursday night and Friday morning or something like that. But if you look at all the things that happened to Jesus, he was taken captive. He was handed over to the high priest one of them, and then handed over to another high priest, right? There's Annas and Caiaphas. Then he was handed over to Herod, and then Herod handed him over to Pontius Pilate. This wouldn't have happened in one night. This is something that would have taken days. And in fact, if you look at John's gospel, it seems to be indicated that this was, it took a few days for all this to happen. And in fact, the early church liturgical cycle seemed to indicate this as well for Holy Week. Okay, so Tuesday night, that's Wednesday. Right? So this is when Jesus would have been taken captive Tuesday night and when he originally probably celebrated the Last Supper. This is the beginning of his passion, which for you and I we would call, uh, this is a Tuesday night, but for the early Christians that's already Wednesday. Okay, So they'd start fasting on what you and I call Tuesday night, and they would end that fast on what you and I call Wednesday night, which is already Thursday. Okay, And then they would do the same thing on Friday. On what you and I call Thursday night, sundown, they'd start fasting and then they would fast all the way till sundown on what you and I call Friday. Why? Because now Jesus is already dead. He's in the tomb. And so these were the two fasts, the beginning and the end of Jesus' passion when he goes up Mount Sinai and comes back down. Right? When he, this is the new covenant. Right? Okay. So then, by the way, Christians still do this today. Wednesdays and Fridays is still the traditional fast. Right? Okay, and then it says, uh, your prayers, so that's what you do, how you fast. How shall you pray? Well, where do you get this stuff? Pray and fasting. This is out of Matthew's Gospel. Out of Matthew chapter 6 and 7, this is right out of there, right? All right, so then it says, when you pray, here's how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, you know the prayer. 
Again, just like the order in Matthew's gospel, fasting and then prayer. Same thing. Then it says, say this three times every day. Three times. Three is complete. That's a Semitic image. Three, complete. So pray the Lord's Prayer three times. When did they do this? In the morning, midday, and at night. Right? This is mid morning prayer, midday prayer, and evening prayer. What we call matins and vespers, or orthros and vespers, and then in the middle of the day. Okay? All right, so then it says also, now, after you've talked about baptism and fasting and prayer, what are you going to talk about? The Eucharist, right? This is what the early Christians would have done. They baptized individuals at a service. Think of an Easter vigil, right? Traditionally, so you baptize, then you continue on with what's called the, the liturgy. And you hear from Scripture being read, and, per, and then you come into the Eucharistic part, which is what the baptism was all about, right? And so it says on the Eucharist, at the Eucharist, at the Thanksgiving, Evcharistia in Greek, Thanksgiving, offer the Thanksgiving prayer, the Eucharistic prayer in this way. Begin with the chalice, we give Evcharistia, we give thanks to thee, our Father, for the holy vine of thy servant David. This is probably a reference back to Genesis 49. Remember, Judah is the one, the tribe for, that will rule over the people of Israel. This is the first designation of Judah being the origin of the king, the Messiah. And it says he will bind his colt to the, uh, to the vine, right? So the, uh, the vine here. So the, the vine, Judah, son of David, all that imagery we're going to see. It's very Methane, very early Jewish. Thy servant David, which thou hast made known to us through thy, uh, through thy servant Jesus. Thy servant Jesus. You get that in Acts chapter 4, the servant Jesus. Again, early church references here. All right, and then it says, Glory be to thee, world without end. Then over the broken bread, we give thanks to thee, our Father, for the life and the knowledge. This is very Joanine, the life and the knowledge. Right? The life, probably John 3.15, uh, or maybe the prologue in John and the knowledge as well. All right, Acts uh, 4.27 again, you get thy servant Jesus. That's Acts 4 again, thy servant Jesus. Acts 4, 27. Glory be to thee, world without him. At this broken bread, once dispersed over the hills, was brought together and became one loaf, so that, so uh, may thy church, again, look at the use of the word church there, Nathan, be brought together from the ends of the earth into thy kingdom. One loaf. Where do you hear that in the New Testament? That the church is one loaf. Very good. That's right, Father. First Corinthians, remember, Paul says, We are all, we are all one body because we all partake of the one loaf. Right? The one bread. Yeah, we're one loaf. And, and what's really interesting there in First Corinthians chapter 10, he also talks about, he says, the cup that we bless. Notice the order. Cup first, then the bread. The cup that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we bless, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And because we all partake of the one bread, we are, uh, the one loaf, we are one. Right? We're our one body. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, the earliest Christian literature in the New Testament is Matthew's Gospel. Well, first of all, it would be 1 and 2 uh, Thessalonians. Then you would get um, uh, Galatians and 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And, and then also, very early, right around that period there, would be Matthew's Gospel. Again, notice how many quotes we're getting from the earliest of the, early of the New Testament literature. Okay, so then, it says, goes on, um, No one is to eat or drink of your Eucharist, but those who have been baptized in the name of the Lord. For the Lord's own saying applies here, give not that which is holy to dogs, right? To those who are not part of the kingdom, right? That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, right? Don't give holy to dogs, don't throw your pearls before swine. Again, Matthew's gospel. And then, so don't take which things are good and sacred and give it to things that are non-sacred, right? 
You gotta be baptized first, right? You also should hear a reference to Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. No one may partake of the last of the of the uh, Passover meal unless they are circumcised. Baptism for the early Christians was the new circumcision. You get this in Colossians chapter 2. Paul says, You have all been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands in your baptism into the body of Christ. Right? Okay, so then, um, also, by the way, notice it says, baptize in the name of the Lord. Wait, I thought they baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Exactly. So you also find an answer to the conundrum that is often raised by modern, some modern Pentecostals and four squares and things. Oh, we baptize in the name of Jesus. That's how they did it there in the church. Where do you get that? When Acts says, baptize in the name of Jesus. Well, yeah, but Matthew, this is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It must be that baptism in the name of Jesus, the baptism in the name of the Lord, was done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the only solution. If you're going to read Acts and Matthew together, and look right here. One piece of literature uses both, uh, both uh, uh, descriptions. Right? Baptism in the Lord means, bap- in the name of the Lord, means baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how you do it. Okay, so then look what it says. says, uh, Thanks be to thee, Holy Father, for the sacred name which thou hast caused to dwell in our hearts. That's uh, God dwelling among his people through Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and following, the New Covenant. Glory be to thee. And then look what it says. Thou, O Almighty Lord, hast created all things for thine own name's sake. To all men thou hast given meat and drink to enjoy. Meat there being food, Right? Food and drink to enjoy, that they may give thanks to thee. Look, to all men God has given food and drink. That's what it says, right? But look at this. It says, but to us thou hast graciously given spiritual food and drink. Spiritual food and drink. Where do you get that? Spiritual food and drink. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Or chapter 10 again, right? Chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate of the same supernatural food, and they all drank of the same supernatural drink because they drank from the rock which followed, and that rock was Christ. You hear that? Same, he's the same language, the same idea. You're getting first, this is first Corinthians, you're getting Matthew, you get first Thessalonians, things like that. Early literature here. So notice also, here you get in the Didache, what you get clearly in the New Testament, that this is not ordinary bread and ordinary drink. The, everyone out there, God's given food and drink. But to us, he has given something special, a spiritual food, a spiritual drink, something from heaven, right? Heavenly bread, heavenly drink. This is all Exodus imagery as well. All right, so then uh, we get a section, lots of other great stuff here. Hosanna to God of David. This is stuff, uh, lots of imagery from the New Testament you're already familiar with. We get here also a next section, chapter 11 and following, is now what happens uh, with your leadership? So, I mean, look how simple this is, right? And you get the, this is the essentials of the Christian faith, right? Live the good life. Follow the way of life, not the way of death. Okay? All right, now that's aside. That's what you do when you're out there. Now when you gather together, here's how you baptize, here's how you celebrate, here's how you pray, and here's how you celebrate the Eucharist. It's early Christian liturgy, right? Now once you're done talking about that, well, who's in charge? Now it moves on to that section, right? It talks about apostles and prophets. There's a long section here, prophets and apostles. Apostolos means someone who is sent. Someone who is sent. We find in the early Christian literature that there were missionaries. There were guys who stayed in place, but then there were also guys who traveled. Missionaries. And the missionaries, as we read the Didache and look at the New Testament, the missionaries were called apostles and prophets. Probably due to their character. An apostle, someone who was sent to you, right? This church sends this guy off, like Paul, off to this other church to go check it out and take care of things over there. They're sent. Kind of like a, uh, a guy to kind of come and check things out and make sure, you know, quality control. And then he moves on to the next church or something like that. 
The prophets were probably missionaries as well. As you read from this, they're kind of itinerant. They go from place to place, but they're the teachers. They're not simply making sure this is right and that's right. They stayed among the people for a day or two, and they prayed with them, and they exhorted them. And uh, so probably more of like a more of a spiritual element there. Okay? We don't have time to look at all these details. Now, it goes on to say in verse or chapter 14, chapter 14, it says, Now, assemble on the Lord's day. This is section 14. Assemble on the Lord's day. Now, in the Greek here, Lord's day, Kyriake, Kyriake emera, the Lord's day, is a phrase you get in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Don't confuse this with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when God visits his people to judge them. And I don't confuse that with the Sabbath. There's nowhere in the Bible you're going to find the Sabbath of the Old Testament called the day of the Lord. That seven-day Adventist will try and pull wool over your eyes and say that, but it's not anywhere in the Bible. The day of the Lord is the day when God visits his people for good or bad, right? For judgment. We want to be ready when he comes. The Lord's day is something else. This is a different phrase in Greek. The Lord's Day, you find in the, you get reference in Matthew, or in the book of Revelation, the Lord's Day. I was in the Spirit of the Lord's Day. And then the other place you get this New Testament is in 1 Corinthians, when you gather together, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Kyriakon Zipnon, the Lord's Supper. This is a particular type of adjective, Kyriake. So, and you find it in the early Christian literature as a reference to the day when the Lord rose. And that's also when you celebrate his supper, when you gather together. Okay? What's beautiful about this, look what it says. In the English translations, it gets assemble on the Lord's day. But in the Greek, in the Greek, it says gather together on the Lords of the Lord. The Lords of the Lord. Which is a splicing of two phrases. The Lord's day, day of the Lord. Okay, and it's been spliced together, which means the early Christians understood what we've always said, is that when we gather together, we celebrate his death and resurrection and we await his return. This is what we do when we gather together as Christians. We hope and pray when we gather together and we're in church praying and worshiping the Lord. This is when we want him to return because this is when he is returning to us sacramentally. Right? What better time for him to return eschatologically? All right, so then, uh, what else here? Then it talks about local administration. Local administration, look what it says. So the apostles and missionaries, these prophets, these guys travel from place to place. Think of Paul on his trips, right? But who stays there in place and governs the place? Well, it says, you must choose for yourselves bishops and deacons. A bishop is an overseer, and a deacon is a servant, diakonos, table waiter, okay? Who are worthy of the Lord. Look at that, bishops and deacons. Again, it shows you how early this text is. You get that language of bishop and deacon without the word priest in, uh, in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. You get it in the first lines of the letter to the Philippians. This is the earliest stage. The apostles went from place to place and they left an individual in charge. That guy's called the bishop, the overseer. They laid their hands on them, and this guy was the apostle who didn't move, right? He was no longer an apostle. He just stayed there, right? Apostles means someone who's sent. He stayed. He's a resident. He's the overseer. But these guys got busy, right? They need help. And so we find the apostles, or and also the episcopate, uh, creating what we call the diaconate. We see this in Acts chapter 6. The servants, they need help with the liturgical celebration. They need help with the, the, the caring for the poor and bringing bread, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. The arrival of what you and I call the priest, this kind of intermediate thing, is something that we find after the first century. We start first seeing the 
concept of bishop, priest, deacon in the letters of Ignatius, which we'll look at later. Okay, So again, that shows you how early this text is. This text is written before we get to the stage two, when not only have they developed the diaconate, but also the priesthood. This is before that. So this, again, this is why scholars say this is somewhere in the first century. Otherwise, this text would say bishops, priests, and deacons. They were, it predates the writings of Ignatius. Okay? All right, we'll talk more about that development of what we call the priesthood, this intermediate thing, uh, later on when we get to Ignatius. Okay, then look at the next paragraph there. Reprove one another, but peacefully and not in hot blood, as you are told in the gospel. Told in the gospel to reprove people nicely and peacefully. Where do you get that? Matthew 18. Matthew 18. If someone you have a disagreement, go and see your brother. Doesn't listen, take someone from the church. If he doesn't listen, then tell it to the church. That, well, then treat him as a tax collector or a Gentile. Right? But you start out very peacefully. Again, look what it says, that last line of chapter 15. In your prayers, your almsgiving, everything you do, be guided by what you read in the gospel of our Lord, which tells you that they're already reading the gospel of our Lord in their gatherings. And what gospel are we talking about? Well, it's quite obvious from the quotations. This author is assuming that his audience knows the gospel of Matthew, which they're already reading. Again, it, it geographically locates this text, and also, as I told you, chronologically due to what it, other quotes you get here from the New Testament, the earliest literature. Okay, so then find es uh, then the last section, eschatology. Right? Again, this is, okay, now what do you talk about? If, if you're, you're going to, when you're out there in the world, live the Christian life, the way of life versus death. When you gather together every Sunday, make sure you baptize this way, and you pray this way, and you celebrate the Eucharist this way, and make sure your church is governed this way. And then, what else do you talk about? The return of Jesus. The second coming. That's what it's all about. We're waiting for him to come back. And so you get this last section of eschatology. Be watchful over your life. Never let your lamps go out or your loins be ungirt. Lamps go out? What gospel does that appear in that parable? Matthew, right? The, the foolish virgins, right? Oh, okay. But keep yourselves always in readiness, for you can never be sure of the hour when your Lord may be coming. That's Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25. You get that line a few times. Come often together for spiritual improvement because all the past years of your faith will be no good to you at the end unless you have made yourselves perfect. Where do you hear that you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect? Matthew chapter 5, right? Matthew chapter 5. In the last days, the world, in the world, false prophets and deceivers will abound. That's Matthew chapter 24. Sheep will be perverted and turned into wolves. That's Matthew uh, 6 or 7, I can't remember. And love will change to hate. That's Matthew 24. For with the growth of lawlessness, men will begin to hate their fellows and persecute them, betray them. Matthew 24. Then the deceiver of the world will show himself pretending to be the Son of God. Where do you get that? The man of lawlessness coming. Huh? Yeah, Second Thessalonians. Again, look at this. Er all these quotes are coming from the earliest of the Christian literature. Uh, and the earth will be delivered into his hands, and he will work such wickedness as there has never been since the beginning. That's Matthew 24. After that, all humankind will come up for their fiery trial. Multitudes of them will stumble and perish. So fiery trial. Uh, you get that either. You can see that in Matthew chapter three. He will. He has a winnowing fork. You also get this from Malachi. Uh, again, quotes from Malachi in Matthew's gospel, and then also um, <clears throat> Matthew chapter twenty-five, being cast into the fire. Multitudes of them will stumble and perish, but such as remain steadfast in faith will be saved. I love this by the curse. What? How can you be saved by a curse? Who's the curse? Right? What's the curse? 
The cross, right? The cross. Remember in Galatians chapter 3? Cursed, you get get a quote out of Deuteronomy. So again, Galatians, early Christian literature, quotes out of Deuteronomy, very early Christian. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, right? This is Galatians. All right, and also in Acts of the Apostles, you go hint at this. And then the sign of the truth will appear. First, the sign of the opening of heavens. Next, the sign of the trumpet voice. The trumpet. The opening of the heavens, the trumpet. Seraphim? Where does that come from? The trumpet blast, the voice of the trumpet. Huh? Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai good. Yes, absolutely, Mount Sinai. But in the New Testament. Yeah, you get trumpet blast for Revelation, yeah. First Thessalonians, who he's talking about the trumpet blast, first Thessalonians chapter four, right? And the dead will rise. And thirdly, the rising of the dead. This is right out of First Thessalonians chapter four. Not of all the dead, but as it says, the Lord will come and with him all of his holy ones. And then the whole world will see the Lord as he comes riding on the clouds of heaven. And so there you get, you can see that in First Thessalonians chapter 4, or it could be Revelation chapter 1, or you could be having, in that language of Jesus riding on the clouds, this is not just Matthew chapter, or Revelation 1, you get this in the first part of Acts. He goes up on the clouds. This is, these are all, Jesus coming on the clouds, these are all losing to Jesus as the Son of Man from Daniel chapter 7. The one like the Son of Man riding on the clouds in the ancient of days, being given all dominion, power, and authority. One of the most important texts for understanding the New Testament. Right? Okay, that is the didache. And you can see why a Baptist, when he reads this, is a bit shooken up. Right? This is not what we do. This is not how we believe. This is not my paradigm for the faith. But this is your paradigm. If you're Greek Orthodox, or you're a Melkite, or you're Byzantine Catholic, or you're a Roman Catholic, Russian Orthodox, whatever you may be, that's your paradigm. That's your understanding of the church. This is it. Where does this come from? The first century. Right? Why do you need to know this? Because there are many Christians out there today who don't. Right? And you can take something like this, hand it to your Baptist friend, and help them come to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. And to Him be glory with His Heavenly Father and His all-holy and life-giving Spirit both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.